Hold on, a little difficulty with our coat in there. Okay, here we go. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, this is the sixth time I have had the opportunity to provide uh, an update to the people of New York City on the preliminary budget for the upcoming year. Uh, I want to say at the outset, the word preliminary is very, very pertinent in this case. Never has the word preliminary been so appropriate in my previous uh, five years because we're dealing with some very unusual circumstances here, which I'll go into. So uh, this is um, our effort at this moment in time to say how we will proceed as a city against an uncertain backdrop. Uh, clearly, we'll be back in a couple of months with the executive budget, hopefully having a lot more uh, solid information at that point to act upon. But the reason for the uncertainty, there's three specific challenges we face. The first and the greatest is our overall economic situation. Uh, the uh, national economy is at a point that is uncertain. Uh, we are seeing the impact of that reality on our revenue already. Most notably, the volatility in the stock market is affecting revenue in real time, and we are very concerned about where that may take us, but we're much more concerned about the bigger trajectory of the economy and what that could mean for New York City and for our budget. Second, uh, the decisions in Albany, I'll go over them in a moment. Uh, but very specific uh, proposals already before us that would have a very substantial negative impact on New York City. And a situation in Albany is getting uh, tougher as we go along in terms of the fiscal situation. And then third, uh, uncertainty emanating from Washington that some of that is on the policy front, for example, the trade uh, issue, but some of that is uh, more immediate. Uh, the possibility of yet another shutdown and what that would mean for us. No one is predicting it, but it is a live uh, and real possibility. So those are the kinds of things that are coming together to create an unusual level of uncertainty that we're doing our best to address in this preliminary budget. Now, depending on how each of these realities develop, uh, we well may have to uh, limit some of our investments or slow down some of our investments or in fact cut some programs and some investments outright. Uh, we have some uh, tough choices up ahead under any scenario. We will be guided uh, by the need to make hard choices, to find savings, and then when we have to choose, we will favor uh, the priorities we believe are most strategic and high impact. And if a program is nobly intended, but not as strategically central or not as valuable, uh, that's where you will find the cuts. So let's uh, talk about some of these pieces. The first and most important, again, major uncertainty is the economy. Uh, more and more observers, more and more uh, key players in our national economy, particularly in the business community, are seeing signs of a recession. There's a pretty strong uh, debate right now about whether a recession is coming in 2019 or 2020, but there is a very high likelihood that it's going to be one year or the other. This country is right now in the second longest recovery ever since World War II. It is now a 116-month-long recovery. That is a very good thing. The problem is Economic history teaches us that uh, all recoveries eventually end. So by any normal measure, unfortunately, a recession is in the offing. Uh, this is a situation that a lot of people have looked at, obviously, including some of the people who predicted accurately the 2008 crash and some of the people who did not see the 2008 crash uh, coming. Uh, both sides that divide, you hear more and more voices saying some kind of slowdown is imminent. Uh, particularly notable to us was what happened in December in uh, the stock market. Uh, the month, as you will remember, began with extraordinarily troubling declines and volatility. By the end of December, we saw the biggest monthly decline in the stock market for any month since the Great Recession, so almost a, a Looking back over a 10-year period, December 2018 was the single 
worst month for the stock market. Again, that had a very immediate impact on our revenues. But it's unsettling that that could have happened, and we have no way of knowing if that was uh, aberrant or if we might see something like that again in the near term. Clearly, uh, there are major, major unresolved issues of policy that are affecting the economy, most notably on the trade front. We see a weakening housing market. Um, so there's a, a series of things that uh, cause us tremendous concern. In terms of our tax revenue, we see it slowing clearly. Uh, convert, uh, compared to last year, last year we saw a distinct uh, one-time uh, spike in revenue because of the federal tax law changes. We uh, saw that coming. We projected that. That happened. But in fact, it was one-time only. It was not expected to be recurring revenue. It proved not to be recurring revenue. Uh, what we're seeing this year is uh, particularly uh, a problem in terms of personal income tax. We have seen our uh, collections go down, uh, and now, uh, compared to projection, almost $1 billion lower than the projection that we had in place from last year. So that uh, is all substantial unto itself and immediate. The second major uncertainty is what's happening in Albany. Uh, I'll be speaking about that in greater detail on Monday when I give my budget testimony in Albany. But I do want to go over the big picture, and it certainly is cause for concern. When the governor announced his uh, budget, uh, there were almost $600 million in cuts and cost shifts for uh, the next fiscal year included. Uh, that is a very troubling starting point to the process. That includes uh, about $300 million less in education funding than we need about $125 million reduction in uh, TANF and financial assistance to families in need. Uh, and there's also an impact on shelter costs, foster care, mental health services, uh, a $59 million cut in health services, which includes a family health disease prevention and emergency preparedness, and a $13 million cut for our initiatives to keep young people out of foster care and to keep them out of uh, detention. So these are all uh, substantial pieces. Uh, we are very concerned that that was a very big hit. Remember, in recent years, we have sustained other state cuts. And these are permanent cuts. I want everyone to understand that. When these cuts occur in the state budget, it's not just for one year. The, the, the money goes away, never comes back. This is a, a very big additional hit being proposed. We're going to fight it hard. We're going to fight hard in the legislature to get as much of this reversed, reversed as possible. But uh, history shows that you know, we win some, we lose some. And so we cannot be overly optimistic when we're starting at such a substantial figure. That uh, budget proposal from the governor occurred before the announcement earlier this week, which adds concern to the situation. Earlier in the week, the governor and the state controller together announced that the state is experiencing a $2.3 billion shortfall for the current fiscal year uh, for their budget, and they project a $1.6 billion shortfall for next year. That's a problem uh, for the state, but it's also a problem for the city because that puts additional pressure on the state and leads to choices that, again, could directly or indirectly hurt the city. So we are braced for a potential additional problems uh, when the governor announces his updated budget. Third and last is the situation in Washington. A year ago when I presented the uh, preliminary budget, I talked about uh, a manufactured crisis in Washington. Uh, we had a different version of that uh, this year with the shutdown. We saw the negative impact of the shutdown on the economy. Uh, we saw how much money was wasted as a result of the shutdown. We obviously know there is a possibility of another shutdown. Again, I am hopeful that the lessons learned a few weeks ago will prevail and that it won't come to that. But we have to be sober about the fact that there's nothing that has changed appreciably in the president's position, and so we may be facing uh, that danger. Again, reminding people to central elements to the dangerous shutdown that we need to think about in terms of this presentation, the most important one, the impact on everyday New Yorkers. Uh, once a shutdown occurs, if it were to occur at this upcoming deadline, by May, 
New, York, New Yorkers would be losing about half a billion dollars a month in direct support, uh, things like food stamps and school lunches and a variety of things that directly affect our people. Also, the city government would be losing about $110 million each month. Uh, that would add up, if it went on for a year, to $1.2 billion. I don't predict that. I am not trying to offer a, a doomsday scenario. I'm just trying to ground us in the real dynamics of what a shutdown means. If it happened again and it continued to set new records for longevity, there are real immediate uh, dangers to our budget. Obviously, we're going to work very hard with our representatives in Washington to do all we can to avert such a situation. So when you add up those three challenges and you say, okay, what does it mean in terms of the decisions that uh, we brought to bear for this preliminary budget? It means that we have decided to institute a PEG program, a program to eliminate the gap in the budget. This is the first ever PEG program under this administration. We have constructed it in a way that we think is sensible, it is not the same approach taken uh, in past administrations, but it is the same, uh, it shares the goal of mandatory savings being required from each agency. Uh, the overall uh, game plan is this. I'll talk about some other savings we have already achieved and some ongoing savings, but this is additive. These are additional savings that we must find basically in the next two months. The goal is, and it is a, when I say goal, this, everyone will be held to this. It must appear in the executive budget. There will be an additional $750 million in savings that we will find in the next two months. We will use a variety of tools to get to $750 million. One of those will be expanding our hiring freeze. We will focus the hiring freeze now not just on where there are vacancies, but on our use of attrition. And where there is attrition, there will not be a guarantee that lines will be filled or filled immediately. Obviously, there will be major exceptions for uh, particularly vital services. But we're going to focus on uh, expanding the hiring freeze as a central piece. But the piece that is most important is the PEG program. Every agency will be given a specific dollar goal they must meet. It will be individualized to the agency. Uh, this will be a very straightforward exercise. Every agency will be required to come up with real and tangible savings. Uh, uh, bar will be set high to ensure those are the kinds of savings that we need. Uh, I would say at the outset, I believe every agency will respond in an appropriate fashion. But I also want to be clear, so all New Yorkers hear this, and certainly all of our colleagues in the agencies hear this, that if uh, agencies are not forthcoming with the kinds of reductions we need. The budget director, Melanie Hartzog, will herself make the decisions about what those reductions should be in each agency. So now I want to just outline the overall uh, preliminary budget. And this is a good moment to thank uh, everyone who has spent so much time uh, preparing this budget, and, and we're all getting prepared for the long months ahead in this process. I want to thank, of course, our Deputy Mayor, starting with First Deputy Mayor Dean Foulihan, and Deputy Mayor for Operations Laura Anglin, our Deputy Mayor for Housing and Economic Development Alicia Glenn, and Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services Erminia Palacio, our Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy Initiatives Phil Thompson. I want to thank my Chief of Staff Emma Wolf, my Chief Policy Advisor Don Williams, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs John Paul Lupo, and of course, our budget director, Melanie Hartzog, and everyone at OMB who have done uh, their typical outstanding work in preparing for this uh, announcement. also want to thank uh, Speaker Corey Johnson and Finance Chair Danny Drum. We've been working very closely with them and their staff as well as we led up to today. The uh, number I want to start this piece of the presentation with the most important uh, point, which is the actual uh, number of this proposed budget. The fiscal 2020 preliminary budget will be $92.2 billion. There has been a substantial growth since June, and that is related to several things that are very specific. Uh, the two biggest are the labor agreements that we have uh, come to with uh, some of the biggest unions in the city and has obviously set the pattern for all unions. Those labor agreements have added about a billion dollars uh, since uh, 
the adopted budget from last year. So we've had about a $3 billion overall increase. That is about a third of it. Another uh, $632 million, if I'm getting it right, is in education, the number one element within that. About half of that is additional special ed spending, so around $300 million. Uh, reaching uh, many families who were not getting the special ed services they deserved previously. Uh, important part of that is uh, our 3K initiative, which we have been expanding. Another part is mandatory charter payments, which again are an area of concern because this is uh, a mandate from Albany that is costing more and more money and is uh, one of the reasons why the budget is growing. Uh, we can go into other details as to uh, other elements uh, when our budget director gives her presentation. Now, I want to remind people, before the announcement today related to the $750 million in uh, additional savings that must be determined by the executive budget, and that includes the PEG program and the expansion of the hiring freeze, we already had uh, required agencies to find uh, substantial savings, the preliminary savings program, it's $1 billion for fiscal 19, fiscal 20. The $750 million is on top of that. Uh, and also important to say that the health care savings also separate, $1.6 billion in fiscal 20, $1.9 billion in fiscal 21, and that will continue for every year thereafter at that $1.9 billion level. So there's the, the main body of our savings program. There's the health care savings and the additional $750 million in new savings, including the PEG, uh, those are three distinct elements that all point in the same direction, finding savings so we can uh, keep our services at uh, existing levels to the maximum extent possible. In terms of reserves, we are holding steady with our reserves at this moment. Uh, total reserves, $5.75 billion. That's $1 billion in the General Reserve, $250 million in the Capital Stabilization Reserve, 4.5 billion in the retiree health benefits trust fund and the vast majority of that about 3.6 billion is because of budget actions taken in the course of this administration and, and working very closely with the council there are a few things to talk about in terms of investments but what is generally true is this is a, a preliminary uh, budget presentation in which there will be fairly uh, small new investments and relatively few new investments. This is the smallest amount of new investment uh, at any point in the last six years. Uh, and that is uh, an indicator of the situation we're facing. Uh, one of the areas we've invested in consistently, and these investments have unquestionably paid off, uh, is in the area of public safety. We are obviously the safest big city in America. Uh, wouldn't change a dime of how we've used uh, our money in terms of those investments. Uh, one of the areas that we still need to do better in is in terms of preparing our officers to handle mental health challenges, to handle emotionally disturbed uh, individuals. So we're accelerating our crisis intervention training. It's proved to be very effective. We want to make sure it reaches all officers who are most likely because of their duties to encounter emotionally disturbed individuals. Uh, the plan we now have accelerated will have, has had already a number of officers trained, but all such officers will be trained by the end of 2021. The cost in uh, fiscal 20 will be $5.3 million. The uh, question of affordability uh, takes many forms. Obviously, I'd say in many ways the number one issue in this city, uh, what we're focusing on in this budget, we're obviously continuing a lot of our Previous initiatives, but the new one we announced, the State of the City, gets at the cost of health care at the 600,000 New Yorkers who are uninsured. And we have uh, created a plan that will guarantee health care for all New Yorkers. Uh, NYC Care will reach about 300,000 New Yorkers who are not eligible for insurance. Our public option, Metro Plus, will reach, uh, we believe, uh, as many as 300,000, the remaining pool of those who are eligible but uninsured. We have a very aggressive outreach effort already underway. The investment is $25 million for fiscal 20. That ramps up to $100 million per year by fiscal 22. Another area we're focused on in terms of affordability and equity is in terms of transportation. We all understand uh, people need to get around to get to opportunity. And for so many New Yorkers, 
of real limited means. This is a huge challenge. That's why we're continuing our commitment to the Fair Fares Initiative. It is ramping up uh, consistently. Uh, we are putting $106 million into uh, the preliminary budget for fiscal 20 as we continue to build that program and evaluate the real costs. In terms of uh, education efforts, we're building out uh, priorities that we have already set and accelerating uh, in the area of 3K, investing $25 million in fiscal 20 to add a new district in the Bronx, District 8, a new district in Brooklyn, District 32. This is almost 2,000 new 3K seats. With this additional investment, we will have a total of 20,000 uh, of our three-year-olds in 3K this September. And that means uh, 14 districts uh, will be represented by uh, September of 2020 that I've already been committed to. It's almost half of our districts. And that will include our 10 highest need districts. Another point on addressing a, a really uh, profound need for New Yorkers in terms of getting around is the speed with which people get around in the area of our buses. We talked about this in the state of the city as well, need to move our buses more quickly. We have a plan to get buses moving 25% faster. One of the key elements of that is synchronizing traffic lights at 300 intersections uh, per year, uh, 300 new intersections, I should say. That is an investment of $2.7 million per year starting uh, in the upcoming fiscal year. So those are some examples uh, of the kinds of investments that we have uh, considered critical to make here. And that talks to the expense side of the budget. I'm going to spend a very quick moment on the capital side of the budget. Uh, and obviously, we produce the 10-year uh, capital strategy uh, every two years. And so the capital plan for the upcoming period is $104.1 billion. And the focus of this plan is on a lot of the initiatives that have been underway and very effective. A huge focus, of course, on creating affordable housing. And that includes the commitments we have made to uh, our public housing, to NYCHA. A big focus on continuing efforts to protect our bridges to continue to improve our roads and repave. Uh, obviously, a focus on uh, maintaining what is uh, considered by many the finest water supply anywhere in the country, and with a lot of work, a lot we have to do to keep that in, uh, in good order. A lot of expansion of school seats. This is one of the number one issues I hear from my fellow New Yorkers, many, many neighborhoods still experiencing overcrowding. Big commitment here to additional school seats. And of course, resiliency efforts addressing the challenge of global warming, uh, something we will uh, be committed to for many, many years to come. So uh, as I conclude, <clears throat> I'll just say a few words in Spanish and then turn to Melanie. Uh, you know, that you've all heard the truisms, uh, the truism that uh, budgets are a statement of values. Uh, that's going to play out uh, in these coming months. Uh, if we uh, get continued good news, from Washington, from Albany, from our broader economic context, uh, we'll have more freedom. If we get bad news, we'll be ready to make some very tough decisions. Uh, we will make those decisions. Some of them will be hard, but they'll be based on our strategic imperatives. And uh, that's how we'll go about uh, making sense of each one of our choices. We said, beginning of this term, the goal is to be the fairest big city in America. And one of the other things we said was, that should inform every decision. So if you have to make a choice between two programs, which one has a bigger impact on creating a, a fairer society? That's uh, the prism through which we will look. Uh, we believe if we keep ourselves uh, focused on strategic uh, matters that we can make the right choices and continue to sustain the progress in this city. Uh, but uh, we do also recognize an unusual level of uncertainty, and we're preparing for it. Few words in Spanish. El presupuesto preliminar que presentamos hoy toma en cuenta una posible reducción en ingresos y decisiones de los gobiernos estatal y federal. Nos veremos obligados a tomar, tomar decisiones difíciles para limitar, posponer o recortar nuestras inversiones. 
A pesar de esto, vamos a seguir invirtiendo dentro de nuestras posibilidades para construir la ciudad grande más justa del país. With that, I want to turn to our budget director and thank her for her extraordinary efforts leading up to today. My pleasure to introduce Director Melanie Hartsog. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to quickly walk us through the changes since our November financial plan update and remind everybody that there's a technical briefing uh, directly after. So if we can go to the first slide here. Thank you. So as the mayor said, the fiscal year 20 preliminary budget is $92.2 billion. We closed a gap of $3.2 billion for fiscal year 20, and fiscal year 19 remains balanced. We achieved more than a billion dollars in agency savings in fiscal years 19 and 20. We've maintained our historic reserves, $5.75 billion, and continue with our cautious estimates on the revenue and debt service. And our out-year gaps are manageable, $3.52 billion in 21, and oh, going up to 3.3 billion, I'm sorry, going down to 3.3 billion in 23. So in terms of our revenue changes, while we're reflecting increased revenues in this financial plan for 19 and 20, we're also noting that tax revenue is not growing at the same rate as fiscal year 19 compared to 18. As the mayor mentioned, in fiscal year 18, we saw one-time growth of the personal income tax. We now forecast that the fiscal year 19 personal income tax revenue is projected to be about $935 million less than last year. This is partly related to lower than expected personal income tax collections in December and January. Quickly on reserves, um, just a quick note, because we're nearly through this fiscal year, we are reducing our fiscal year 19 general and capital stabilization reserves. This is a routine adjustment that we typically make in the preliminary budget. We've jumped, so I'll just quickly point out we're on the all funds slide, but for fiscal year 20 on city funds, we're at 67.9 billion. And on all funds, as I said, we're at 92.2 billion. So the next is our um, capital, 10-year capital strategy. Keep going. So this is a pie chart that breaks out our 10-year, and as you can see, our largest capital investment is in infrastructure. And finally, on debt service, just want to point out, I think this is very important, that our debt service payments do not exceed 15% of our city tax revenue. This is the benchmark for responsible capital financing. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Okay, we're going to take questions on the budget. Yes. Mr. Mayor, you talked about the, this is the first tank program for your administration, but it's not a percentage, it's a dollar amount by agency. So yes. how are you guiding the agencies to, how are you setting that dollar amount by agency and what guidance are you giving them? I'll give you the, the broad stroke from my point of view, but um, let our budget director give you a little more nuance. I would start by saying what we did not want to do was an across the board single percentage goal. Um, I think that is um, strategically ineffective because it doesn't recognize uh, where uh, the efforts of agencies are particularly crucial and it doesn't um, recognize the history of agencies in terms of what resources they have or not have, have not had. So we wanted to come up with a tailor-made structure based on uh, protecting our strategic imperatives, but also looking at which agencies we thought had more to give uh, and um, working hard to get them to tighten their belts uh, and make some choices. Uh, we know that uh, every agency does its best, but some have uh, programs that perhaps have not been as effective as hoped or haven't kind of yielded as, uh, the kind of results we would have liked. Uh, some have areas where they can find efficiencies uh, some have personnel decisions they can make that even if they're not ideal, um, they're sustainable. So it really is about fine-tuning. That process will happen this month. So by the end of the month, each agency will have its goal. And then, again, they'll have an opportunity to come up with their own plan to meet it and to satisfy OMB's criteria. Anything you want to add? Okay. Go ahead. 
Um, just to clarify on that, so OMB then will tell the, an individual agency you need to cut your budget by $100 million or whatever. Uh, let's, let me, uh, just in the, in the uh, name of not being misunderstood, let's just use X and Y for this point. You know, they, uh, an agency will get, you know, you, this agency could, needs to cut X amount, this agency needs to cut Y amount, this agency needs to cut Z amount. OMB will determine the dollar figure. Uh, the agency will then have the opportunity to come up with a plan uh, that achieves the dollar figure. Um, if OMB is dissatisfied with that plan, doesn't think the savings are the right choices for any variety of reasons, they can say, please, you know, hone it here, adjust it here, come back with something different. Um, if uh, after uh, extended dialogue, OMB does not believe the plan is sufficient or workable, then Melanie Hartzog will decide for that agency what those cuts should be. Go ahead. On a uh, budget topic, a different topic, um, does the budget include any additional funding for the MTA? No. No. Go ahead. So you're asking for these cuts, but some of the concerns right away are always that it's going to impact essential services for people, libraries, uh, firehouses. We've seen this before. How are you? Is there at all a strategy to say this is where we want to start the cuts? This is the last place we want to cut. Are you given that kind of directive at all? It, we are at a point that I'd say is early enough where we're doing it differently. First of all, we, we are not going to undermine the most essential services, which are public safety, for example, or public schools. We're going to work hard to ensure that the frontline services are absolutely consistent. That does not mean that a public safety agency or the DOE can't find savings uh, that don't affect frontline services. You know, I think it's fair to say, and look at what happened uh, at health and hospitals. Part of why health and hospitals has become much stronger is under the leadership first of Stan Brezhnev, then of Mitch Katz. They found substantial savings on the administrative side, for example, or on the way uh, that revenue was collected. Uh, equally, even though we have a long way to go to turn around uh, NYCHA, there were major changes made in the first couple of years of this administration uh, in the staffing of administration at NYCHA that saved quite a bit of money. Uh, so the goal is to never negatively affect uh, the everyday experience of New Yorkers. So at this phase, I would say we're in that kind of vein. Now, you might have programmatic cuts. You might have a program that has not proven to be sufficiently effective and is something we say, you know what, good try, but this just should not continue. Or it, might be, it maybe continues at a more modest level. You also may have personnel cuts. An agency may say, you know what, given the choices we have to make, will have 50 fewer employees compared to cutting some other things. It will not ever be by layoff. I want to affirm at this point there's no discussion of layoff. It would be obviously either attrition or not filling vacancies. But uh, agencies will have a chance to offer a plan that they think works, but OMB, to quote uh, George W. Bush, OMB will be the decider. Please. I just want to say this is not a process um, also in which we simply say the agencies, here's a target and get back to us, right? We want to have conversations ongoing with the agencies to get a sense of what their ideas are. So it may be that there are efficiencies that they could achieve by doing things differently. That's part of what we're talking about with the partial, um, deepening the partial hiring freeze. We're not just going to look at new hires, but we're actually going to look at in the same way that they're looking at a new hire for a month, there's been several uh, positions that have attrited. Do you need all those positions filled? Is there a better way to do the work? And so this is a process that's ongoing communication with the agencies. It's not simply one, and inclusive of the deputy mayors and leadership here, it's not one in which we simply say to the agencies again, here's a target, get back to us in, in a month or two. Yeah. If I could add, you're talking about all these uh, possible stormy clouds and no horizons, but you're in, in the horizon, but you're not talking about increasing the city's reserves. And it's for the same reason. Money and, the, and the budget's still growing, so. Yeah, again, the, we, first of all, uh, it's been an uh, iterative process, iterative process. It's been five years of adding to the reserves, so thankfully we're in a position where we have strong reserves. But we can't at this moment commit to additional reserves given uh, that we need to find this kind of money. It just doesn't make sense. It's still, a reserve is still, if you will, an expense. 
So uh, we want to start by finding the additional savings. Uh, now, two months is not a long time. So if in two months we find that there's a bigger problem than we thought, uh, we have to look at a whole lot of other measures then. Um, but right now, it's sort of in the balance of things. The argument would be we have a strong reserve level. We, we're, we have to find a way to economize elsewhere. Let's see how that goes before deciding anything else. Yes. Do you have any, you mentioned before that even frontline agencies can implement certain cuts at the DOE. Do you have any sense of what kind of cuts the DOE can make? Like sure. That? I mean, I'll give you an example that's already happened, and I want to commend uh, Melanie and her team. I mean, there's been a longstanding question with deep respect for the good work of DOE. There's been a longstanding question about whether they had become too dependent on consultant contracts and whether there were areas where they could cut back without uh, negatively affecting uh, direct services for kids. Uh, already in the savings plan, before we talk about the 750, uh, there's 20, 23 million in cuts to DOE consultants. Uh, that could well be an area where there's more uh, to be found. But uh, again, I use the H&H &H example, I use the NYCHA example. Uh, oftentimes, uh, there are administrative cuts that can be made um, or other types, uh, of, uh, other types of savings that can be achieved without affecting frontline service. That's certainly what we're going to be looking at. Yeah. Um, advocates have raised the issue of money for counselors in schools that have high populations of homeless kids. I know in the past it's been an issue where yes. in, in your initial budget that it was added in. Is that assumed in this budget? Is that, or is we that assume, uh, first of all, we have substantial resources going to address the particular needs of kids in temporary housing, both in shelter and other types of temporary housing. Um, we're continuing those efforts. It is uh, an area where we're continuing to try and perfect the best strategies and decide which money should go where. So we're not listing it here. We intend to list it going forward when we get to a decision on what's the best approach for the upcoming school year. But the commitment will be consistent. OK. Yes, Sally. Um, two questions. Fringe benefits, which it includes health care, it looks like it's going up almost a billion dollars from 19 to 20. And it seems like that's happening even as you're trying to get the unions to do concessions. Can you just explain why there's any, and whether it's going up also to 13.3 billion by 23. So if you're getting these concessions from the unions, can you explain that steep increase over the years? Just as, as I turn to Melanie, I just want to start by saying, look, over these last five years, we've seen a much more productive relationship between labor and management in this city. Uh, the health care savings have been very substantial. There's already a process underway to find additional health care savings, and that will be a collegial process. So this is just to affirm this is something that never stops. We're, we're always looking sort of for the next generation and the next generation of health care savings as one example. But to the fringe issue in general. So as the mayor said, we've already achieved health care efficiencies um, through the labor settlements. And essentially what we're doing is bending the curve. There's more the work that's happening with, in partnership with the MLC um, that's addressing it. There's a complication, Sally, that has to do with, uh, and it's very technical, um, as the year-over-year -year growth, it includes some of the prepayment. It is too technical to get in with this broader group. I'm happy to talk with you about it um, at the technical briefing. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. So the overall budget is also, you know, it's going up this year and for the out years. Can you just talk about why, if you're concerned about the economy, why is spending going up so much? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll do the, I'll do the less expert frame. You know, again, so let me, let me, I think this is really important to sort of the theory of the case here. If you say today, look at New York City, how do we feel? Uh, 4.5 million jobs, strong local economy, unquestionably, lots of room for growth. Uh, we're, you know, safer than we've ever been. We see real improvement in schools, much more to be done. Um, you know, we're putting a lot of resources into things that we think are really important to people's everyday life, affordable housing being one of the most obvious. We think that's a good strategic alignment. We think that the things that we're investing in are correlating to good outcomes and the cities. Uh, the, the life of the city is in a strong place right now. We want to keep that progress going. So I've said to all of you over the years, I, I believe there is an investment strategy that helps to foster growth and helps to foster you know, more equality, more opportunity. We're continuing with that. 
We're not going to let a series of challenges move us off our strategy. But at the same time, we got enough challenges that we're seeing on the horizon here that we have to uh, adjust and look for ways to save money without negatively affecting our strategy. The additions that we talked about in this budget, labor deal is a good example. Uh, I feel very strongly that was a fair, smart labor deal. Uh, it, was, it was respectful of the unions, but very fair to the taxpayers too. Uh, it, it put us in a sustainable place. Labor uh, being invested in the future of the city is important. So I wouldn't strategically change that. Uh, the education costs we've talked about, well, I don't love the mandated charter costs, honestly, but it's a mandate. We're living up to it. I think the special ed costs are a matter of justice. It's people, a lot of families were not getting the special ed services they deserve because unfortunately, there was a rather cynical strategy to deprive them of it. We have said we would stop that. We've been consistently stopping that. The legislature has been very strong on that point too. 3K, uh, to me, is a mission critical investment uh, that of all the investments we make in education is one of the most foundational for the future because we were historically missing the impact of early child education, which is, to me, the biggest bang for the buck in all of education. So I'm very comfortable where we are putting our chips but guess what? Like every one of us around the kitchen table with our household budget, if it turns out, uh, you know, you don't have as much money this month as you thought you'd have and you were going to buy a new sofa, you're not going to buy that sofa after all. It's literally that. We're not going to do some things we would have done. And that's okay so long as we stay to our strategy and the strategy continues to produce results. Anything in this row? Going back. Jill. Uh, Mayor, just kind of following up on Sally's question, when you, you know, your first budget was, I think, around $75 billion. We're up to $92.2 billion now. Do you have any concerns about the rate of the growth in that, in those six years? And, you know, it, over those six years, there were some people who had urged you to do a peg earlier. I guess, do you have any concern about how, how fast the growth came before and whether or not you might have won? No, and I'll tell you for two reasons. Fair, very fair question, but I want to answer in two uh, very different but important levels. First, a philosophical level. You know, I have a Keynesian worldview. I think you invest and it has an impact on your economy. Uh, you invest and it helps you achieve uh, bigger goals. Uh, so I'm not afraid of spending so long as we can sustain the spending. Uh, that I think there is... Um, you know, if you will, an austerity-focused worldview that many hold that misses the fact that austerity doesn't work as a strategy, trickle-down doesn't work as a strategy. An investment-focused strategy by government has proven itself here and elsewhere more times than we can count. So since this is one of the biggest uh, budgets in America, it basically, you know, to put it in context, the biggest public budget in America is the United States of America, followed by state of California, state of New York, city of New York. It's the fourth largest public budget in America if by that measure. Uh, I believe that whether you're city, state, or federal, by making those investments, you strengthen your economy, you strengthen your people, you uh, prepare for a stronger future. Wouldn't change that for anything. The second question would be, uh, were we able to uh, sustain it and are we able to make adjustments now? And I'm very comfortable, the uh, answer is yes. Uh, I think if we had not made some of those uh, investments, we would not be seeing the obvious progress in a lot of the areas I delineated before. Uh, I am convinced had we not invested more officers on the street uh, and the neighborhood uh, policing initiative, we wouldn't be as safe as we are. I am convinced if we had not uh, invested uh, in some of the things we did in schools, uh, we wouldn't be seeing uh, the improved graduation rate and the improved number of kids going to college. Uh, certainly in terms of our economy, Investments in job training have helped. Investments that we've made uh, to encourage job growth have helped. So I'm very comfortable that we got the yield we wanted from our investments. And we also put those reserves aside. This would be a very different question if we had not put aside reserves steadily. But we did, and they're there. So if this is the beginning of a, a real challenge, we're turning rapidly now. We see the iceberg up ahead, and we're turning now, and there's time to make the turn. So I wouldn't change anything in the past. I'm comfortable that right now, if we need to make a lot of changes, we can. Please. 
I just want to add that even in times where you, we've seen higher revenue growth year over year, the mayor has also called on savings plans for each of the plants. So you know we're in a good position because we've continually looked for savings and we're going to continue to look for savings. At this point, as the mayor said, that we are looking at slower revenue growth. And I think this is the fiscal prudence upon us all and the charge to actually implement a preg, to be aggressive, make sure that we achieve that target, moving into the executive budget, and continue to monitor and look at where our revenue collections are um, as we go into the executive budget. Um, you, I believe you said that the increase of the total budget is about $3 billion. From, from adopted to now. Okay. Um, you said about a billion dollars was labor agreement. Yes. Uh, $300 million was special ed. How much was 3K? How much was charter cost? And we're still missing a, mil a billion and a half dollars. Yes, so we'll go over that. So I'm going to say it for everyone, and then Melanie's going to jump in and do the rest. One billion plus labor. 632 million education, single biggest component, about 300 million special ed. Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, mandatory charter costs, 113. 113. Pre, uh, 3K expansion, 109. 109. And then there's other pieces within education, and then I think you have fringe and other things you're going to talk about. So you do the, yep. you do the, the 1.4 billion or so. So the biggest components, and I'm going to do the big pieces, there's a bunch of other little pieces that we can get you in the technical briefing, but as the mayor said, labor is a billion, education is 632 million, we broke out those components, debt service is 358 million, fringe benefits are 325 million. Sorry? Debt service. I'm being a budget person going too fast, I apologize. So debt service is 358 million. Fringe benefits, 325 million. There are a number of other different pieces that make up the balance of that, and I can go through that in the technical briefing, but those are the big components. Okay. Yes. The, uh, just a quick explainer of the PEG, so that's 750 million. Is that just one-time savings you know, in the next few months, or is that expected to be permanent savings going forward? No, that's permanent. So, but again, I want to emphasize the PEG is uh, arguably the single biggest piece, but it is 750 combining PEG, expanded hiring freeze, and any other form of savings they can find that's appropriate. Um, but it has to be 750, it has to be recurring. Also, the Amazon yeah. deal, does that play any role in, in this year's budget? Uh, not that I can tell. I mean, I'm happy to let the experts say, but effectively, no. Yeah. Uh, sort of Go follow ahead. up on, on Jill and, and Sally's question. Uh, there are budget deficits, give or take, $3 billion or more every year for each of the three out years. The city only has a reserve of about $5 billion. Are you comfortable with that? And, you know, how, how protective can a reserve be if you would blow through it in a year and a half, provided these, nothing changes from these budget projections? I'll start and Melanie can give a more erudite answer. Look. We've seen the pattern over many years, and that kind of range, you know, three billion plus out year gaps, uh, you know, no one wants to see any out year gap, but in the real world, that's a range that can be handled historically. Um, again, if things got tougher and tougher, we'd have to make more and more adjustments. But if you said to me, is that a number per se that I find intimidating? No, we have had that kind of number in previous years. We've been able to manage it. The most important fact to me is that we have the reserves. We have uh, a history of savings initiatives that are yielding impact, and we're moving into a more aggressive saving stance. Ryan? OK. Yes. Mr. Mayor, on, on 3K, when you launched the program, you said the city would be paying <coughs> for eight districts, and the feds in the state would pay for the remaining districts. Now that it's expanding to 12, why aren't the state and federal government paying for those districts? And what's the total cost going to be on the city in 2020? For, for I'll have uh, Mel go into that, but let me do the, the preface. So as with any new initiative, you, you see how it goes and you judge it accordingly. You know, how effective is it? How fast can you get it up and running? Uh, how does it stack up strategically against other options, et cetera? 
um, it was clear to us that, you know, the day could come when there would be state and federal funding. And I do want to say one of my predictions has come true. There is a Democratic state Senate. I think this year, for a variety of reasons, uh, there's, there's a whole host of things that the state Senate and, and everyone in Albany has to deal with. But a prerequisite, honestly, to one day getting the kind of funding alignment we would want for early child education was a Democratic state Senate. That is here. I believe that will be a long-term feature. Uh, another prediction has come true, which is another prerequisite to getting federal uh, support would be a Democratic House of Representatives, and we have that, and again, I think that's going to be a long-term feature. Uh, the, the entire set is not yet complete. Uh, I think the easy, straightforward answer is that the conversation uh, can happen in Albany uh, starting next year. Uh, the conversation can happen in Washington, I would predict, starting in 2021. Uh, and that's still uh, timely enough to help us achieve what we need to achieve. Meantime, we found we could go farther and we found the program to be very effective. There's huge demand, and we decided to prioritize it. The cost for the 14 districts at full ramp up is 244 million in fiscal year 22. Fourteen districts. I, I will get that number to you. Who hasn't gone? Way back. What's the forecasted revenue for Wall Street bonuses, and how is that changing compared to prior years? At this point in time, as we're looking at Wall Street bonuses, they typically come in in the months of February and March. At this point in time, I can say that we don't see any change at this moment to our forecast. It's very early on, as you know, given that they come in in February, March, and any changes that we'd see would be reflected in the executive budget. What, what is the forecast? For, I'd have to get that from my team. I can get back to you. We can do that in a technical briefing? Yeah. You'll get it in the technical briefing. Excellent. Yes. How optimistic are you that this time Albany on that gave will pass design bill? I know it's going to be frustrating. More optimistic, for sure. I think we've come a long way on design build. I think last year there was a breakthrough, uh, even with uh, some uh, negativity in the Republican Senate. There was still a breakthrough that uh, more and more members of the legislature were talking about it. It was becoming a little more of a public issue. Uh, the fact that it was going to save a lot of money and a lot of time on major capital projects has really started to register. Uh, this year, I'm more hopeful. Uh, very good initial conversations in Albany. I'm going up again Monday. Uh, so I think we'll make progress. Do I think we're going to get uh, everything we want in one jump? Not so sure. But I think we're going to make some serious progress this year. Yes? Uh, the state has almost $600 million of costs onto the city. Um, and that's before the uh, new project. Correct. Are you expecting any, any uh, bad things coming I'm worried. I'm worried. I mean, that's, they've taken a big hit. And, I, you know, I think the state, with all due respect, has sometimes, when they've had a challenge, uh, looked to where they could uh, find resources from the city. I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's right. Um, because everything that we are doing, uh, we need to do, and we have our own challenges, and I've said many times, and I've said it to uh, the state leaders as well, the difference between us and them, we don't have a safety net. Federal government prints money. The state can do all sorts of budget maneuvers uh, to get themselves out of a difficult situation. We have a legal obligation to balance our budget every year. It's not movable. So when they simply raid us, it hits us particularly hard. So I am worried about it. That said, we're going to fight these cuts. And I am hopeful in the legislature there's going to be a lot of sympathy. OK, Willie. Um, you say that the projection now is for personal income tax revenues to be $935 million below the previous fiscal year's collection. But you knew that that was going to be a higher than normal year. So what was your projection for this year's tax collection, and how much off of that are you? Let me, let me have Melanie speak to it, but I just want to affirm the one-time revenue coming off the Trump tax legislation was recognized as one-time revenue. So I think you're asking an apples-to-apples -apples question. Please clarify. <laughs> You are. So um, back in the executive budget, 
And when we talked about the one-time revenues that came in, we did in fact say that there was a portion of that that was one time and that it was not reoccurring, but we did have a forecast that had some incremental increases. So you're right, we did in fact, and very cautious about it, said that that was not going to be reoccurring. Between that time, we also had some additional revenues come in at adoption for personal income tax. That was one time as well. It was not reoccurring. As we moved into the November plan, what we started to see is the impact of the December stock market volatility. And that then, we said, okay, before we had, let me just backtrack. In the November plan, collections were looking strong. And we then incrementally made an adjustment upwards. After November plan, we started to see in December, the volatility of the stock market. And so that's when, in fact, estimated payments started to go down and would led to the adjustment that we're making another incremental change downward of $177 million in personal income tax. So over the course of the multiple plans, and as we look at what our projection is for fiscal year 19, that's how we're saying between those two years it goes down and that we're now at a $935 million down. And I can get you all the changes in the technical briefing for each plan to plan so you can track the numbers. You said that this is the smallest amount of new investment in a budget under your administration. What are, what are the numbers comparatively to previous years? Do you have that list? We had it. It's a lovely list. Okay, well, we'll give people a chance to find it because I've held it in my hand like a day or two ago. So just give us a second, we'll get it. Who hasn't gone? Yes. Uh, what, what's the total of homeless spending this year? And do you think your peg is going to apply to the DHS and DSS? The peg's going to apply to every agency. But again, it will be an individualized dollar figure. Every agency can find savings, um, but we're going to be sensitive to the challenges each agency faces. So that's the broad answer in terms of what is the, the budget in terms of homelessness. There, the only incremental add that we're reflecting in this plan is $25 million to the homeless budget and that is for street outreach and for drop-in centers and for safe haven beds. And I can get you the full number of the total fiscal year 19 budget for homeless services. And at just, the technical briefing. Yeah, and just noting on that, that those initiatives, safe havens and the outreach efforts and the drop-in beds, uh, we're seeing a real impact in terms of getting people off the street and, and keeping a lot of people off the street, and, you know, permanent homeless folks coming in, staying in. So this is an area where we're essentially flat, as you heard, on homelessness spending, but this was an area we think has a, a big potential to change things on the street favorably and obviously to serve people in need. Please. Are you concerned, Mayor, that um, if you're finding these efficiencies and savings in the Department of Homeless Services, but you've been spending <coughs> so much more over the last few years, are you concerned how that looks, that you've been increasing spending while doing things inefficiently? No, I don't consider it that to be the conclusion. First of all, what you're seeing here and the fact that we had to make a lot of investments to change the approach. I mean, that's what the Turning the Tide plan is, which is, you know, a little under two years old now. Uh, we had to make a series of investments to improve conditions in shelter, to get people off the street, and that the, clearly the Homestead Initiative, which took a lot of investment, has worked and is an important part of our strategy. Uh, investments to uh, acquire uh, buildings, which is something we want to do more of going forward. Uh, you know, there's been a host of things that we're doing, and obviously building, we're in the process of building 90 shelters. All of that was, I think, structural and strategic. Uh, the very limited additional investment now says that we've reached some kind of equilibrium point. But my point about agencies is, even agencies that are you know, very efficient, very effective, constantly can look for savings. They can work to be more efficient, more effective. Also, agencies that have started an initiative, it's one thing to start something up when you get uh, to the doing of it over years. You should be able to find ways to do it more effectively. There's a learning curve. There's you know, trial and error in some cases. So no, I don't find that surprising. And I do believe, bless you, I do believe they'll find what we need. Go back there. Uh, yeah, just some back of the envelope math. Um, your administration is committing, give or take, $3 million next year and on the subsequent years to start resignaling traffic lights in the city to speed up bus service. By those numbers, it would cost about $112 million to resignal all 12,000 intersections with a traffic light in the city, which is a fraction of the support that the city provides for its ferry service. Two million people ride the bus every day. 
few thousand people take the ferries every day, why has you know, the administration been so slow to invest in improvements in the bus service? And you're constantly talking about making New York the fairest big city it can be, the fairest big city in America. Do you think sort of this dichotomy between investing hundreds of millions of dollars in ferries that benefit a few thousand riders every day while you know, being slow to the ball um, on, on the bus service sort of gets to sort of a tension in those claims. The, um, there's a couple of different moving parts here. Historically, our involvement with the bus service revolved around select bus service in particular. Obviously, the MTA runs the bus service. And uh, the more we have looked at th things over the years, the more we thought there were important things that we could do to contribute to improving bus service. I will be very straightforward to you. That's not something that was a front burner issue in year one, year two. It's not something that was a big part of the public debate. We were not focused on it because it literally was not appearing, at least for anything I saw, as uh, an area where we could have that kind of impact. I thought a bus service, for one. I thought MTA, uh, with the exception of a select bus service. But the more we have worked with the MTA, the more we've looked at the problems, the more we recognize there were ways that we could have a very big impact, and we want to. Now, I, I don't know about the math, honestly, because I don't know about which intersections have bus service and how frequent one thing or another, so I don't know what that universe would be. Uh, I do believe that the focus here is on the bus lines where it would have the biggest impact on the most riders, and I think it's a very good investment. The point about ferry service, and this is a variation on a question I've heard many, many times, I'm very comfortable with where we stand on this. We cannot structurally stay where we are on mass transit. Uh, we need to improve our existing mass transit, and that means MTA. The best way to do that is with a long-term financing plan. That would change life in New York City. That is something we cannot achieve here in New York City. It can only be done in Albany, but that would be the single biggest, best thing to do for mass transit in the city. That is not enough. I've said it many, many times. It's not enough. If that's all we did, we would not have enough mass transit going forward. We are, I think we can all agree, there's very, very intense limitations on the creation of new subway lines in New York City. Uh, we are continuing to expand select bus service, but you can't do that everywhere. Uh, we need more and better options. Uh, bikes have been one of them. Ferries has been another. Uh, light rail would be another. So we are playing a long game here. We're saying this is a city that's going to be 9 million people before long, and it must have a much richer uh, mass transit system. It must have much better options, more options. And that's why we're investing. I think it's the right thing to do for now, but I think it's even more important to do for the future. Let me see. Anyone hasn't gone yet? Go ahead. You mentioned that in the upcoming budget, you may need to um, cut, make cuts to investments and also some programs. Um, are there any programs that you've identified that you don't think are performing as well as they should be, or programs that would be uh, like the first in line on the well, obviously, I appreciate the question, but it's, this is not the day we're going to delineate them. I mean, there's, uh, do I have some uh, concerns? Sure, I'm sure our budget director does too, but that's why we have a process to really go through the numbers and really scrub and see what the truth is. But my point in saying that is uh, we're going to look at uh, programs where there's a concern that maybe we're not getting the impact uh, that we expected or it's not worth uh, investing in compared to other things that are more important. I, I'm not going to list a list today, but that's what this exercise is all about. And I suspect when we get to April, there will be specific uh, programs that we're telling you uh, we've slated for change. Anyone who hasn't gone, let me see who hasn't gone. Katie. So I know you, you just mentioned some transportation options, and this week the city uh, approved a $7 million environmental review with the DQX. And there's been a lot of critics to this because a lot of people don't see the point of this sort of multi-billion dollar projected thing. I mean, with given the city's financial outlook, do you think what amounts to be, I guess, like an elevated G train is an effective use of the city's funds, especially continuing along with environmental reviews when it still seems sort of um, not as effective for transportation issues in the city? Well, obviously, there's a certain amount of assumption in that question, so I'm just going to say uh, there's clearly a deep need in that part of the city. It's, um, if I'm remembering my numbers right, the route covers uh, uh, an area where it has about 400,000 people within walking distance of the line. 
That's an astounding number of people. Anywhere else in the country, that would be the, the biggest city anywhere around. You know, that's, it's clearly an area that needs more and better options. And uh, as I think you know, uh, I think the fact is the figure is something like 40,000 public housing residents along that route. Now, what makes it different, it's very fair to say in the context of a budget concern, how can you afford it? It is entirely different than anything else we're talking about because the only way it happens is if there's substantial federal support and through uh, the improvement in uh, property tax receipts that we would expect because it exists. And that is a value capture model, but again, it's a city-based value capture model where we're saying this is, a, this is the correct use of value capture because it's our own city and we believe it's the right thing to do. The exposure to the city government is limited. So uh, I do think it's important. We have to have more and better options. And if you look around the country, uh, I think the going uh, reality now, there are some places building subways. There's a lot more places that said subways are not going to be effective. The much bigger bang for the buck is light rail. We don't have it appreciably in this city. It's time to see where we can go with it on top of everything else because we need a lot more uh, for this city to work. Anyone who hasn't gone? Go ahead. Did you, oh, you went. Anyone who hasn't gone? Hasn't gone. Hasn't gone. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you talked about how you, the, you're not going to undermine frontline services, but are you really going to ask the NYPD to, to find places to cut money, an agency that historically has never, they're always given more and more? I mean, when you to follow up on Sydney's questions about if you have an idea of where these cuts might come from, is there really going to be cuts there? Sure. I, I, there's no such thing as an agency that can't find efficiencies if we're in a situation that demands them. It's choices. NYPD is doing an outstanding job. NYPD has a lot of different uh, elements to their work. Uh, what we're most concerned about is frontline direct protection of everyday New Yorkers. That's going to be the piece that's going to be uh, untouched. But there are other things they do. And the question is, are there ways to do it more efficiently? It's a very normal exercise. Uh, that, you know, I think most agencies find things that they can say, okay, this is something we can do without, this is something that we don't need now, maybe in the future, but we can live without now. This is something we can do at a lower level of intensity, but it's still get the job done. Uh, there's lots of ways to approach it. We're going to give agencies a chance to present their own version. If we think it's fair, great. If we think it has to be something else, OMB is very good at determining those kind of options. But yeah, this is, you know, especially an agency that has succeeded. You know, I see your question, but I'm going to say, I think we have a stereotype in our head. Oh, you know, a, a, a troubled agency is the place where you find savings. I would argue an agency that has succeeded should be able to build upon that success and find more savings. Can we see if there's anything else? Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, you included $106 million for fair fares in fiscal year 20. That's the same amount that was included in this year, too, is that correct? Yes. So do we have an update in terms of how many people have enrolled in the program so far? The end of February, we'll do a public update on the number of people enrolled, and then we'll do it at the end of every month thereafter. It's, you know, this is a, obviously a new initiative. Uh, we are uh, building an outreach effort to go with uh, the application process. It's going to steadily grow. Uh, and as we go through the rest of the fiscal year, we'll have a really good sense of what the take up has been. Is that 106 million just funding the actual program or is there a portion of that that's gonna be set aside to publicize the program? It's yeah. all, I've, I've always seen it as combined. I mean, you, it's the administration of the program, it's the promotion of the program, but obviously the main body of that money is for people to get the subsidy. Anyone else going back? Yes. Uh, following up on transit related matters. The governor is once again pitching his congestion pricing plan. People who have looked at the plan say it would give the Triborough virtually unprecedented authority to sort of do what it wants on the city's roadways in order to install a congestion pricing scheme. Uh, one of my colleagues at the Post, Nicole, folded in her column of Robert Moses-esque power play. What do you make of the criticism and are you comfortable with giving the, the, the authority that once served as Robert Moses' seat of power that kind of latitude over the city's infrastructure? No, we, um, there needs to be a, a real conversation in Albany about what's fair. And we'll certainly be speaking to the governor and the legislative leaders. 
Um, you know, my bottom line has always been we need a long-term funding plan for the MTA. Right now, I count five potential elements to that plan. Uh, I believe in millionaire's tax. Everyone knows that. Congestion pricing. Uh, internet sales tax has been talked about. Some portion of marijuana uh, tax revenue has been talked about. Uh, a state bond act has been talked about. Five different possibilities, uh, different combinations obviously could work. That's the crux of the matter. But as a plan is developed, it must respect the rights and prerogatives of New York City. Uh, and I'll make that very clear in Albany. Uh, and I certainly expect uh, everyone to understand that, and I expect the legislature to be particularly sensitive to that reality. Yeah. On, on, on the capital budget side, a, a few council members were expressed concern <clears throat> that there doesn't appear to be any funding for the construction of the new jails, uh, even though the plan goes for 10 years. Um, why, why is it? Why isn't that money in the... So the approval process for the four new borough-based jails will conclude in the fall, and then uh, the design will begin right away. The money that's in the capital budget is certainly more than enough to accommodate design. But if you think about fiscal year to fiscal year, uh, approval, let's, uh, I think the projection now is September, October is the approval. Um, you're a few months into the fiscal year, you go right to the design process. The only thing that's going to happen in the next fiscal year is approval and then design or beginning of design. You won't have shovels in the ground. So this is a, a number, it's a very substantial number, but still a placeholder number. When we get closer, we'll be able to put in uh, a final number. And this is consistent with how other major initiatives have been handled. It's, you don't expect to put the, you know, the, the overall number in on day one. We will get to it. But I, I'm confident this plan is moving forward. Just, and I know that's been uh, past practice, but what, what's the purpose of a 10-year capital plan <clears throat> if you don't include known costs? Because uh, I think as a layman, I would say there's constant variability and choices that have to be made. Today, uh, we don't have a firm estimate on that cost. That's a process we have to go through. Uh, you know, if you don't even you don't even have a design yet. There's a lot that we need to do to get to a more uh, tangible uh, estimate. But we also know in capital spending uh, that there are things that don't uh, move forward for whatever reason. We know there are things that take longer. There is an ebb and flow. I, I didn't understand all of this when I started out in terms of uh, the many interesting dynamics of budgeting. But uh, these two fine individuals have schooled me with their teams. This is just the reality of budgeting. What we know is the, the dollar figure we've put in is what we uh, can depend on today, and we know that that flexibility is normal, and we know that the, uh, the borough-based jails are going forward. You said that there won't be a, a broad-based cut across all the agencies, that it'll be variable depending on the agencies. Which agencies are you asking to cut the most amount of money? Well, again, that's the process that OMB will go through, by, and by the end of this month, every agency will have their number. Um, clearly, to some extent, it depends on the size of the agency, so you know what the biggest agencies are, but it will be with other factors, too. So I'm not going to project. Uh, OMB is charged now with coming up with the specific number for each agency. Let me give you a previous answer uh, on our preliminary budgets. So we have had six of them. When you add everything... And this is, again, every part of new spending, things that were strategic initiatives or things that we, for whatever reason, uh, had to include because of, uh, in, you know, various um, whatever it is, legal matters, labor settlements, whatever. The, uh, the increase for this preliminary budget is $499 million. Uh, the other years... I'll try and get them ordered up here. It was uh, 545 in the 15-16 year. It was 690 in the 17-18 year, 750 in the 18-19 year, 833 in the 14-15 year, and the biggest was 1.4 billion in 16-17. So that's been in the two years. Oh, I'm sorry. That's my apology. That's that's why I'm doing the two years, just not saying it right. It's the, it's the current, and, but the point is that the, the number we announced change at preliminary. This is, I'll make it simpler even. The announced increase at preliminary, 
This one is 499, the lowest of the six years. The highest of the six years is 1.4 billion, just to give you a sense of range. Okay, anyone else who has not gone? Okay, Sally, go ahead. I have one other question. On the, will agencies be able to, well, um, increase revenue from fees and fines and things like that, the savings, will they be able to apply that toward these totals you're giving them? Or does this have to be an actual, like, we spent this this year and we're cutting it? That we've always counted on any revenue generation, whether it's for fees and fines, towards the citywide savings program. So that would count. Yes. It's really new. It's yes. Really new. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. So they can continue to do that. They could. Uh, where is the, uh, I think it's a quarter of a billion dollars next year for NYCHA, and where is that? Yeah, it's part the, of the, the part of the settlement. Yeah, it's four years and then two hundred million beyond that. It's in the capital plan. In the capital it's, plan. Yeah, the whole play out is in the. It's a ten-year capital plan. It's a ten-year uh, commitment. Okay. Right. Yes. Uh, I just want to re-ask my question because I can't go to the technical briefing. Uh, I'll try to read. You're going to miss a lot. <laughs> um, your estimate right now for the current fiscal year personal income tax collection is twelve point four billion. What was your forecast at adoption of personal income tax collection for this fiscal year? It was 12.4, but the right the change from right this to November on the incremental was 177 million down. Congrats. So you're actually in line with your original forecast. We've made an adjustment to it, as we always do, as we look at right each quarter and how we're doing. So look, I, maybe there's just clearly a dissonance, and I appreciate the complexity of the issue, but can we agree that we will be, do the technical briefing but also get Willie a clear answer afterwards that makes sense? Okay. Last call. Anything else? Last call. Going once on this budget. Going once. Twice. Okay. Thanks, everyone.